Aiden K. What's up, everyone? This is Aiden K, and today I'm joined by the one and only Mr. Vimo. Vimo. Vimo fucking Vimo. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in his studio. Um, as you can see, the beautiful Chutney Records logo in the background. The big boss of Chutney Records. It's legendary DJ, now producer, promoter, and just a, a pioneer of house music, I feel, in this country at the moment. And has really has done so much for up-and-coming guys. He has been a part of bringing Chanda Monkey, I feel, into into the mainstream and really helping him with his brand and just he i mean he was somebody that gave me a chance i think we've known each other for four years now and at a time where i wasn't really i didn't really have a name for myself and he was giving me a chance to play at some of his events so when i was looking for somebody that i wanted to speak to about being a dj and somebody that i really look up to i think vimo was one of the first guys to come to mind so I'm really appreciative of the role that he played back then in my DJ career. And yeah, I think I'm hoping that people will really take a lot from this video and from what the knowledge that he's actually about to share with you. So thanks for having me in your studio, Bri. Thank you, dude. Thanks for having me. Um, what I really, I really wanted to say before we started this was, I mean, I started doing a blog about a year ago and it was really to help empower young artists, whether they're DJs, producers, even guys that just uh, want to sing and play guitar music. And the support that you've shown me for my blog has really been has really been overwhelming. And I really appreciate you sharing the links and commenting and and helping me grow that side of my brand and 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 just exposing that world because I think there's a lot of kids that look up to you. I mean, through being the the owner of Chutney and, and taking those those demo submissions to just being a DJ that everybody knows. I think people really look up to you. So for you to share the stuff that I'm putting out, I really appreciate that. Yeah, but you're on the right up. You're doing the right things. You, you're like, you know, you're focusing on points like that people want to know. And I think what yeah. you're doing is great. So yeah. well done, dude. Thanks, man. Um, so as I mentioned to you, the motivation for this video was really to answer a question that somebody asked me about if you could be a DJ without producing music. And when I think of you, I think of somebody that managed to build their brand without having to produce music, even though now you've gotten into it. And I think so there's a lot to learn from somebody that's had a career that has lasted 20 years. I think that your lesson and your experience in those 20 years, there's a lot that people can take from. And the reason that I wanted to chat to you and do a video, record it was there's a lot that people can learn and hopefully they don't either make mistakes or they don't yeah. go down the wrong path or there's just a lot of questions that I think people will have that hopefully they can get out of this. Um, so I think let's start off by getting to how you actually got into DJing. What <clears throat> motivated you to say, I want to be a DJ or was it, was it something that you wanted to do as a career or was it just a hobby? Uh, basically, can I be honest with you, when I finishing school and stuff, the last thing from my mind was to DJ. And basically what happened was I was traveling around, uh, I was in London and I was going out clubbing and I couldn't get the music I was hearing in the clubs to put onto my cassette Walkman because I was working in London. So I was working in a pub, so I had to commute 40, 40, 40 minutes to an hour every day and I used to have my Walkman with my cassettes. And what was happening is I just started buying records to record to cassette to to listen to because I just always liked music I've always been into house music and I've always liked that tune that wasn't big on an album you know I always had a sort of a different vibe to what all my friends were listening to and mm. I had my own little collection and but yeah and I just started I just started buying records and the record store owner said you should start DJing mm. and then I went with him to a gig and I saw Carl Cox play shit and I was like <laughs> this is what I want to do <laughs> you know it's like and back then DJing wasn't even like DJ wasn't this superstar guy, like he was just chilling in the club, playing, but Carl Cox had like a name that time, but it wasn't where you had the big productions and yeah. they were all still in clubs. And my friend just took me to the right party and I saw this man play four turntables and I was just blown away. Mm. And I just couldn't believe that you could mix two tracks and EQ it and I just couldn't get over all of that. So that's how I got started to DJ. Mm. It was actually not even, I didn't tell myself I want to be a DJ. Mm. 
It just happened that way. And how did you go about it? Did you learn? Was there somebody that you could at least speak to about it? Basically, I I, I got it so good because I was was living in London in Seoul. There was a shop called Vinyl Junkies. It was in a basement. They had the best turntables, the best mixer at the time, awesome sound. And this guy wanted to basically tell me, like, he just we just started becoming friends and he told me like I'll show you how to play and we, I started going out with him to his gigs and we became very good friends yeah. and I learned to mix in a record store full of records so what will happen is if we were in town because he stayed further out in London we would come back to the shop after a party and we'd sleep in the shop there was mattresses there and <laughs> they'd go sleep and I'll just mix and I had all these record shelves full of records and that's how I learned so mm. I just got shown the basics but the rest I just taught myself so okay. just practice with turntables. It was always just practice and yeah. practice and practice and practice. So and when did you, when did you feel that you were ready to start taking gigs? Did you play for people around you, or did it? Basically, I was in. It was like after about it was it was after about maybe six months or so. I was playing in my friend's shop, going there every day after work, chilling, checking all the new records. I was always in the record store, and and then what happened was the one day uh, this friend of mine he was he was quite a popular DJ back at the time, Jean Paul. And there's like a little bar also just off so in London and he couldn't make the gig. He says, why don't you just go play for mm. me? And that's how I played my first gig in a little bar. And then I started playing like little bar lounge gigs around London. Mm. And then, but nowhere really anywhere big or anything. Just like, it was still like for me, just like a hobby kind of thing. And then When was this? What year was this? This was like, you can call it 20 years ago. So sure. that was when it, that was when it started. started yeah, yeah, in 97. So, yeah, and then at about n- end of 98, I came back to South Africa with a record box full of Speed Garage. There's no one I heard of in South Africa yet. Because <laughs> it was now all, I grew up in the commercial market, so yeah. I didn't even know, like, coming from P, there were actually underground clubs in P, because now I was exposed to this music going overseas. Yeah. You know, so I came back with a whole new mindset and a whole new outlook on music, because I was going to all these parties and, you know, being in a record store, you realize that it's not just all about commercial music. Yeah. It's like got the underground, gone into the speed garage, the sort of the deep. Was there house. a scene for that in yes, PE? Yes, garage just uh, no, no, not in PE. Okay. In London, garage just broke yeah. out, and then garage first came, then came speed garage, and it was huge. It started becoming massive, and and that's I was in that era. I was there, you know. Yeah. So that was very cool. So yeah, you you obviously came back. What were you playing when you came back? Were you well, trying to bridge the gap between what Oaks were listening no, to? No, well, yeah? look, I came back as luckily coming from PE, it's a small place. Everybody knew everybody. And I was always the guy that was always out. I was always in clubs. I knew all the DJs. I knew, you know, in all the clubs because I was always out anyway. Mm-hmm. And basically what happened was I came back and now I'm thinking, shit, I need to play this music. But no, all my friends are telling me, what nonsense is this? And, mm-hmm. You know, because they've never heard this sort of vibe before. So what happened was I was just going with my records and then what happened, I got a, my first residency was at a, a commercial club where we'd play all genres in one night. So you'd play like from mm. hip hop, you'd play R&B, you'd play like sort of commercial house, nothing underground at all. And I would sneak my records in every now and then, mm. you know, just, and like for the first years I played commercial music, I couldn't really play the music that I wanted, you wanted to. to. So I just did, and then one day I just, I, I was playing at this commercial club and there was this underground club opposite the road. And I told the DJ there, which was Monroe, which was one of my, my biggest influences in my career, Monroe from PE, and I just said, I got some records, dude. it's like six o'clock in the morning and this place is still humming, and I'm like, I got some records, would you mind if I play a couple of tunes? He's like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll come find you later. So we're sitting outside talking to some mates, the next thing he says, the DJ's calling you, you know, I said, bring your records. <laughs> So it's cool, I came there with my street garage, I sat for 6, 7 in the morning, I came and I played till like, I don't even, I think like 8, 9 o'clock that morning, just speed garage and the people were loving it and the Monroe said, you know, I'll come back next week. So I'm like, okay. So I played there for like two years till 12 o'clock at night, Monroe would play whole night till 6 o'clock and I'll jump in at 6 o'clock in the morning, mm. like for, for the first two years of my career I played there, which was cool and for free too, you know, so... It was very, that's how it all started for me when I came back. So commercial clubs first and then I got into that sort of underground scene after, you know. Okay. And how did the scene develop from, obviously, Speed Garage was a trend that lasted a few years. Where did it go from then? Like, like I would say, like, you got to understand, my career is two separate careers. Yeah. Because first of all, it's my career when I lived in PE. I've only been living in Johannesburg now for nine years. Mm. The scene in PE to how things work in Joburg, it's like chalk and cheese. Mm. Like, it's so different. Like, it's two totally different stories. Like, PE started happening where actually the, the garage started going, but at that point it was more sort of prog and trance, and that was like like when the raves all started. Mm. And there were never literally raves in PE because it was so small. Mm. It was more club vibes. And then the scene started growing and growing, and then the raves started like maybe 
couple of years later in B, but the big parties were always in Joburg. Yeah. But I wasn't in the Joburg scene at all at that stage. I was just playing all in and around PE, PE East London, the Garden Route, you know, whatever yeah, yeah. was close and around. And yeah, that's how it, it just basically went from rave. So it will always like there'll be different sort of set of slots. Like if you played first, you'd play a house. And then mm. if you played like sort of in the morning four, you'd play trance. And that's how it was like in the underground scene back then. So, but it was cool. It all worked out really well. Like it just, everything happened in its time, I feel. Yeah. You know, like I, 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 I like the fact that I played commercial clubs and back in the day, because I love my old school as well. Mm. So I'm happy with the way it went. And then when jo when I came to Joburg, it was a whole nother. Yeah. That's why when I came to Joburg, it took me like, I was playing here a lot when I lived in P. Mm. But I'll get, that's another question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so you obviously, you went from... Play, playing commercial gigs to playing underground gigs um what i think that really helps with is the versatility because yes. you can play an underground set and i think a lot of people think that by underground it means playing stuff that people have never heard of before that you're trying to expose them to yes. but i think a lot of your responsibility when you play stuff like that is actually teaching people how to like that music yes. you can't just come from playing stuff that they love to going and playing something that they've never heard yeah, before. But also you like, have to still entertain then people. In the in beginning, like, I was playing different gigs and I would play like a, a more sort of mainstream gig in like a pub where I'd play like sort of all like, like sort of deep house, happy deep house, like stomp your feet and mm. shake down at night. And then I'd go to 52, the next gig where I could play all my underground records, you mm. know. So that's how it was in P. I had to play different sort of vibes, but I've always just played house music, you know. Yeah. And that, and in that way, I got to also, that's why our scene grew in P because our stages were playing at other, other venues and kind of educating the people to this other sort of vibe, you know. And it just started growing from there. But also P is small, so there's only as big as it can get. Mm. You can't compare it to what's happening here, you know. So What influenced you to start with house music? Was it the, the scene in London or that you didn't come in? Because, I mean, what I would think a lot of people would assume is that you come back and then there's a scene that's happening in Joburg where there's trance music and trance music is becoming huge. And a lot of people would fall into the trap of thinking, if, I'm, if I want to become a DJ, if I want to grow my brand as a DJ, I must go and play trance because that's what everybody's no, listening to. Let me tell you another side to the story. So I came back to South Africa and whatever. And like I said, then the underground was also trance. Mm. But what happened was I remember going to Cape Town to on a trip to actually go watch. It was UB40. We went for a concert and I went to this club called Pure afterwards. And I was still playing my house, sort of saucy stuff. And obviously playing commercial clubs, I was buying commercial records, hip hop mm. records. I was buying all of that, which I don't regret today at all. I love my record collection. But like I went and saw this guy and he was playing sort of the hardest stuff. And it was like, you know, first time I ever saw this DJ there, high up there on the thing, a massive sound system, just this big dark square. Everybody was, and I looked at the music this guy was playing. Like, you know, with the build ups and the dirty drops. and. Mm. And I thought to myself, like, the difference with that music is, is that you could actually, like now, like house music is here. Mm. You can actually now uplift your crowd, bring them down. And I thought, like, this is really cool. And that's when I got into it. And I came back. And then also, I had to also adapt with the music. Because now, like I told you, if I was playing a two to four set at, a, at, a, at like an underground club, I couldn't really play my house music because mm. it was... Then I started, I've played trance, I've played prog, I've played hard house, I've played it all. So you had to back then, because at different times you played, was a different style mm. you played. That's how the, the clubs were back then, where mm. I'm from. So yeah, I did, I did go in. But obviously, like, all my music, even with, if you take trance, it's all got a similar feel to it. Like, you know, it's got that dirty bass line, the driving music, you know. So for me, like, it was pretty similar. So um, I did play trance, I did go, but then... I would say about eight, nine years ago, no, sorry, what am I talking about? Like 12 or 13 years ago, I decided I just want to play house music. House music, yeah. Yeah, and then I just stuck to house music and it all just evolved from there. Yeah. Do you feel that your brand grew by playing one specific sound and sticking to that and making that your own? Oh, yes, it definitely did because what that led to then is obviously then led to compilations and like people knew me for a certain sound. Yeah. And, it's just it took a while though coming from PE, but the nice part about that is that sound that I got so into was already massive here. Yeah, in Johannesburg. Yeah. So yeah, and that's how it just worked out fine for yeah. me. I just always believe that actually, and I thank the man upstairs that I always made the right decisions at the right times. Yeah. For me, I believe I made a few wrong decisions in my career, but when it came to timing, my my decisions were always most of the time correct. Yeah. I feel like 
to in order to better my career. Like, yeah. you know, so. Well, what what were some of the things that you did to further your career? Because I mean, people now have internet you now have access to youtube you now have access to soundcloud you now have these platforms where you can grow your brand without having to actually physically connect with people how did you go about back in the day with records it was with the music you had yeah you'd, you'd say like that was vimo's tune that was lady leah's tune that was ricardo's tune how i was i was living in p but i was playing a lot in johannesburg and the record shop guys, they used to keep the records for me, mm. so I could take it to P. So the other Oaks in Java, yeah. and I always got the best tunes that way. And my records were always like great, and I always got the best records. And I'd come to Joburg even, and I'd play records that nobody had. But I've always been like a, a real music hound. Like I've always just bought a lot of music. Mm. Back then it was dial up, dude. Like you got to listen to a <laughs> two minute clip on Juno, wait for it to load. And I actually bought music. I'd found my my record shop owners here and they'll put the, on the landline they'll put the headphone cup <laughs> on the speaker on the talking side so yeah. I'd listen to this and they'll skip through it and I'm like okay that's cool and that's how I bought yeah. records because we had no record store in Piantel, well, that's definitely my... yeah it was all about relationships because yes. those record stores were only bringing in a handful of copies of something and, and if and you didn't what, get that you wouldn't have that song and word of mouth and recommendations I mean that is how for me like I got my deeper sounds deals just because mm. I was bringing all these DJs to play in PE and they were like you know telling the deeper sounds guys you need to get this guy Vimo on the deeper sounds yeah. and, and from the time I released my deeper sounds that's when my job career mm. started you could say you know well, I, think I, was, I was chatting to Ricardo about it as well and something that I think is common that's come up here is that a lot of it back then was networking but making connections and seeing what you can do for other yes, people exactly. it wasn't a case of I want to be a DJ I'm going to just ask people for favors all the time it must be a case of what I can do for you as well. I think it's the same today as well. Mm. I would say relationships always go further than anything. I believe. Mm. Like I always believe. I would hate. I hate going to a club and play, and I don't know who the owner is or mm. who the manager is. Like you know, I'm making a point of getting to know these people, mm. especially places you play often, because you want to like build a relationship mm. with them, and that's how. And even though I have a manager now, I still build relationships with because I don't deal with promoters and much anymore yeah. like I used to before. But I always try and like you know have a cool chat with the owner and see what his yeah. idea is. Well, I think that I'm, I'm sure that's something that's played a huge role in your career lasting definitely, so long definitely. is building those relationships. Yes. Especially, I mean, I think when you produce music and that becomes your focus and that becomes what people know you for, the people will dictate where you play because they are the ones that will demand. Yeah. We want to see Vima. We want to see somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you are, if where you decide you only want to be a DJ, it very much becomes a case of the relationships that you maintain with yes. people, because they those promoters are now the gatekeeper to where you play. So having a good relationship with those people, doing things for them that wouldn't necessarily uh, you wouldn't necessarily think and of. I also believe also obviously you need to rock the crowd and rock yeah, the yeah. club and pull it because like I always said when I lived in PE like. If I played a natural groove on a Sunday for two hours, they need to talk about me and stuff to like come back the next time. Mm. You know, you need to create that impression. And there was always a lot of pressure on me as an out of town DJ. You'd come to Job, you'd be playing all these gigs, and now you're thinking, I don't know what who's playing what here. You know, mm. I don't know who's going to, who's been playing the records that I have. And but that was a nice thing. I knew I had a lot of unique mm. records that that I'd keep for my Job sets. You know, so that's uh, because records went out of stock. <laughs> that was the best part like yeah. you know if you didn't get a record and it's gone it's gone you yeah. get it again so yeah that was also how uh, I managed to also like securing that sticking to that sound yeah. like I, that I stuck to that dirty house sound so did you get into the Joburg scene by booking the guys that were also throwing events from Joburg not really or how I, did you go about it basically I've got my first like you know like today it's a producer's game yeah. those days when you did a compilation you got recognized that was yeah. like your big track when yeah. you mix the especially like a deeper sounds which was a very big series yeah. back then since i got my deeper sounds then i started coming to job a lot mm. and like i made relationships with like the guys at natural groove like i spoke to before like all the like the kiss parties and and yeah and then that's just based so once i got the deeper sounds that's when but the referrals came through for the compilation more as opposed to the gigs mm. also gigs but more in the compilation that's what took it to yeah to the because for a PDJ to break out to Joba wasn't easy. You yeah. Know? Do you think it, your your brand is, I think everybody will agree that your brand has grown exponentially in the last five years. Yeah. Um, with the new wave of house music becoming more popular. What do you think has attributed towards that? What do you think has, has fueled that growth? Look, I always said like that was obviously I moved to Johannesburg and then... 
But when I moved to Johannesburg, I came here with the P boy mentality where, and as I said, it's two totally different careers. Mm. And it took me a year or two to learn that year, and that is why my career rocketed in Johannesburg because then I started seeing how things operate. And then what happened was I got offered sugar. And I believe that is what, it was the home of Vimo. It was mm. my vision. It was yeah. my lineups. It was like, you know, like it was, and it was, people love the place because I always say DJs make the best promoters. Yeah. And I ran the club at the best that I can. It really worked. And, and I feel that's what ticked because every, on a Sunday there was like, everybody came there yeah. and, and came there and, and everybody waited for my set. And I feel from there it grew. Mm. I've always had truth and stuff like that. But that's a, so I say, and between introducing that music to there, and I just stuck to that sort of style. I saw it was working and I really liked it, that sort of chutney house, as we say mm. today. And and I think Sugar was the big catapult for mm. me. As well, I remember that was like it was like a family, basically. Exactly. All the DJs w wanted to be there. It wasn't a case of it was a club where the music was secondary. I mean, that club looked terrible. <laughs> to be honest, it wasn't it wasn't a club where a lot of effort went into making the club look good, but the sound was great and the music was great, and yeah. I think it bred a culture for the music that you had. So used. basically, I just got, got offered the shell and I had to yeah. make it work. So obviously, with me, I never I never mess with sound. So I just got a fat sound system in there, mm. and we obviously we we did and in, and it just went really well, and it, I couldn't believe the. The response we had, mm. like at Sugar on a Sunday, it was it became like a culture, you know. It, yeah. was, it was really cool. And I think that's when the sound catapult, because that's when where Chanda came in and like, you know, the Sims and LA and I started booking all these guys and then Trit started booking them. And, yeah. You know, and that, that's how it all started spiral and then we mm. started playing at all the Stones Bedford View now wanted Vimo to play or China Monkey or Carl Watson, you know, where before mm. we just played every now and then. So we it's kind of growing, so it's good. I'm happy with the way it's went. Hmm. Like I said, for me, I was just lucky with timing with everything. Yeah. It was just is like, that what motivated you to? I mean, obviously, sugar closed, and then was that what motivated you to start Vima and his O's? Yes, was still building that because culture. Because for me, I always believed that I go to a lot of events and I think to myself, man, can this guy not do better sound? Yeah, better. And I always believed that I just wanted to show people my vision on what a party should be like. Hmm. I always, I always told my wife like. Two years before Sugar opened, I just want one night to call my own, mm. where it's my, it's what I want to do. It's Your what, exactly what I want to do, you know, and also building cool relationships with people, mm. and, you know, and like so. I said Sugar catapulted it, but from there, it just, it just spiraled so quickly. To be honest, I can't even remember exactly when. Mm. Everything just went so quickly. It was like crazy, man. It was like ridiculous. I just remembered like telling my wife the one day, calling her like, baby, I got eight bookings today. In one day, I got booked for eight different dates. I'm like, can you believe this is happening? And this was like just everything. And that feels like it was the other day. Yeah. It's just crazy. And it's just... And now it's normal. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I got Leah. I didn't even know what bookings are coming in, yeah. you know? So... You just take it's just like, there. I'll never forget that day. I found, I'm like, I got eight different bookings today. And she was like, wow, that's amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> what has been your highlight? What has been the highlight of your career, you'd say? You, you asked me that. And for me... There's different because it's such a long career. Like for me, one of the things that stands out, if you take my older career, which is my PE side, is one of when it was the year 2000. Now, by then, I was still like not one of the best DJs in PE, but I was playing at the school, my first resident club called Shiner. And all the other residents, they were, well, better known than me. They got all these big gigs playing here and playing there for the big millennium parties. And I got stuck at the club and I ended up playing like six hours at the club. And out of all of them, I had the time of my life. Bringing mm. in 2000, I had this banging club and I played for like six or seven hours. And all the other dudes, they were like, the gig was so crap, it wasn't great. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And it was, that was one. And if you come to like, uh, obviously Sugar is definitely a highlight of mine mm. because it was my first, my own place. Yeah. Um, and lately, I would say Corona, Sunsets, last year, in December. Time, yeah, that, was special. that was just very special. That mm. was, you were there as well? Yeah, 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 you were yeah. there. I mean, the mountain behind you, yeah. the sea of heads, and then the, the sea behind yeah. that. That was just too special. I remember playing and telling Chanda, dude, look at this. Yeah, you like, couldn't be that Just stop what you're doing and just look at the yeah. around us, you know. It's just I think the thing is, is that some is with Corona specifically is that that sound now has been able to get exposure on these huge stages, yes. whether it's Ultra, whether it's Corona, whether it's Rage. 
you you now have moved from small clubs of three or four hundred people that are moving at, at sugar where it was something that was yeah. still like slightly small i mean it, that place was packed but it could only hold so many yes, people yes exactly yes and now you're playing that music to ten thousand people it was like just this year alone like for me i was we're talking about the other like this year it was h2o main stage we on rage main stage this year it's our first rage main stage mm. so i love that which means our music is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger it's mm. it's just amazing and i honestly believe that it's it's because of all of us that pushing the sound all the time because call a couple of years ago edm was yeah. within a few years this music had just become from it's basically for me like it's techno it's like it's just like not the hardest stuff and everything just becoming bigger in the other genres now which mm. is so cool so yeah it's cool to play main stage i always believe like i got offered main stage before and i tell i tell the guy from Asia, i'm like i want to play deep revival because yeah. that's where i'm suited yeah. you know yeah well yeah. i think this was the first year that main stage has been mainly first, house focused yeah, yeah. and also because he told me i'm opening for croatia, croatia squad i'm like oh that's perfect that's why <laughs> yeah I took it and it was amazing. But I think I think you you saying there's always been this theme of great timing in your career. I think something else that you've managed to have great timing with is starting your own label. I think now there's a focus for that music. I mean, I remember when I started DJing, Fidget was big, yeah. and there was nowhere really that you could find it unless you knew those oaks I who were producing. That <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, that was one of the reasons I never played it because I couldn't find it. it. Unless you knew the guys making exactly, it. Exactly, because none of the labels internationally were really releasing it. There was a few, but if you didn't really know about that, especially when you get into DJing, you don't know. Like, I mean, it's, it's a bit different for you, but when, like, 10 years ago, Beatport wasn't that big. No, you, 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 how, did you find, how did you find music? And I was like, fuck, how am I going to find this music? And I just, what ended up happening was I just then went just onto, really, yeah. onto Beatport and I started looking for Tech House because that for me was easily accessible. I could relate to it. But that and was it, the it next set genre me up, yeah. after Fidget Ring, exactly. was the Tech House. And what I, think, what I think Chutney Records has been able to do now is give producers a platform to release that music and give DJs that want to play that music a platform to find that music. And it's just, it's, as you said, it's that perfect moment in time where that sound is so big right That's now. That's the exact answer that you gave me to that question. Like, you asked me what made you start Chutney Records. It's because the music I was playing, I couldn't find. And it was all my friends' music. So I thought, let's create a platform for mm. me, for all my friends. We can, we, I know all my friends, I'm lucky that my DJ friends are my friends. Like, we all one big click, mm. which is really cool. So my friends are my favorite producers. Let's release all this music, you know? Let's, it's all sitting on the computers. Telling the guys, stop making bootlegs. Let's get the stuff out. I yeah. got a label now, you know? Yeah. And what's nice is now, like, I'll give you an example. Like, someone, like, say, uh, let's say use Master Sims, for instance. He's just made a track. Oh, what do I, who do I send it to? Fima will sign it. Mm. You know, that's what it's about for me. Like, I think that that is the reason why I did the label. Because everything was right in front of me. So, what was the motivation for deciding to then you want to start making your own music? Look, I've always also, like I told you, I've always wanted my own night. I always wanted a record label that was like records. Yeah. So basically where a certain label when you bought vinyl was like unique to that sound. Yeah. And I and the reason why also is that I couldn't find the music that I was playing. And then I realized that 80% of my set was all local and they were all like my friends. So I thought, why don't we make a platform for the sound and for the local guys? Because I honestly believe that the sound we have, like that I've labeled Chutney House, because I don't know what else to call it, is very unique in mm. the world. Even like international guys that come and say that it's a very unique sound. So that's where the label came about. And I thought like all my friends, at least they can make a track and think to themselves, you know, FEMA will release this. It gives a platform for all of them. So, mm. and also local artists and up and coming artists, etc., etc. So that's how the label came about, yeah. basically. It's just because for simple reason, I couldn't find the music that I liked because there was no genre for it, mm. so to speak. So mm. that's how the label came about. And what would you say has been the, the sort of motivation behind wh why Chutney House? Why did you? It was really funny. Um, it was actually a, a MC back in Port Elizabeth and because I'm Indian, he just started calling me Chutney. And <laughs> you know, back in the day you played and you always had the MC and he'd always yeah. say, uh, Mr. Chutney with his Chutney house, you know? And it just stuck from there. Yeah. So it's just always been that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird though, I know, but I, I just thought it's cool because I'm Indian and it goes and it's, it's cool. 
Okay. What would you say has been the, I mean, 20 years is a long time. Bro. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's almost a lifetime. There have been these moments where you've been able to move and move to Johannesburg, and that's obviously kept you motivated. And, yeah. and it's it's a, it's sort of a, a new start, and then starting the label and having your own club now. What do you feel has kept you going? Because I mean, it, I don't think people realize how difficult it is to be a DJ. That's not yeah. that's not just a glamorous lifestyle. Yeah, it's also like you know I've obviously struggled a lot through my career, lots of ups and downs. There came a point in my career where I actually was at the point of throwing my towel in. Mm. You know, like it's DJing also, it's very like, it's very up and down. Like, you know, you can be here today and tomorrow you can be here. And, and like, you know, it's, and then it's just about just working hard and constantly thinking of what to do to, to make Fimo as a DJ into a brand. Mm. And f what motivates me is that my ideas work. It's like, you know, you could think, oh, I want to start doing events and then I'll do an event and it will really rock. Yeah. And that, and I'm lucky that I have the support of the people that really support me in whatever I do. Like, yeah. but it's also all in time with, with the Vimo brand. Like the sound is part of the brand. It's, for me, it's all about creating something that's still within like sort of my circle, you could mm. say. So the label also, it still ties in with what I do. And I just believe that that motivates me like to just constantly try and see what I can do next like i'm already thinking now like next year what's the plan what am i gonna do different what am i gonna like you know it's it's already starting now normally this time of year I th this is the time of year where i start thinking now what's the plan now for next year mm. where's the music going what's happening also with the label now it's, yeah. it's more thinking it's a, now you got to think on a global scale yeah. as opposed to south africa you know yeah. so that's because constantly and for me motivation has just been the music mm. Like, I can never, like, I'll be in the worst moods. I'll be how tired. I'll put a tune in the studio. I'm jumping around here like a mad thing, you know? It's music's obviously been the main motivation for me, but it's also of, like, trying out things, and for me, it w it's working. That motivates me as well to, like, know that what I'm doing is right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I don't know where the future holds, but, like, I'm constantly motivated, and I'm very lucky that I have very supportive wife, very supportive family, so in that, that also helps a lot, mm. you know? Because I think that's that's very difficult, especially when you start being in the industry after, let's say, four or five years where your le your learning curve and your growth start to plateau, where you go from those small baby steps, where you sort of, you, you have bigger steps in the beginning, where you go from never playing at a club to playing at a club, never playing at a festival to playing at a festival. Yeah. That, that growth is then quick, and then it sort of tapers, and yes. you eventually start having to go, well, what am I going to do differently every year? Because a lot of Oaks will just do the same thing every year, year in and because year out. Because I always say, and I truly believe this, that, me being as old as I am, I've got to work twice as hard. Yeah. I see it in my friends. Like I've got to work twice as hard as maintaining my brand, creating, mm. carrying, on, keeping my my peeps happy, and with the music. I believe I've got to work because there's a hundred kids waiting to take my place. That yeah. that's come out of school, and all of a sudden they have ten thousand Instagram followers, and that's the world we live in today. Yeah. You know, so for me, it's constantly about trying to better myself and giving my each set my all. And like, if I don't get music in a week because I've been so like. I'm actually depressed. Like, I, I don't really want to go play. Yeah. If I've got, like, old tunes. Like, for me, it's like... Now, that's what I told you. I always say this. I am a DJ long before... I'm a DJ. I'm not a producer. Yeah. I'm a little bit of a producer, but I'm a DJ, and that's the DJ way of thinking is... For me, I always say the art of DJing is to rock a crowd to tunes they don't know. Yeah. That, for me, is the... I've always lived by that. Yeah. And I always believed in sticking to my sound and rocking crowds to people, that tunes that move me. I've never played a track... Because I know that the people are going to give it, I don't like it. So it's all of those things, like, you know, st when you stick to what you believe and you see it's working, that really motivates you. And I'm just very blessed that way, that what I've done, it works, like, you know, so. I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that you're old. <laughs> Look, uh, in con if you compare I, it to everybody else yeah. I'm around, I'm very yeah. old. I mean, I think one of the, th I think one of the things that, that, might give people the misconception that being old means that you you wouldn't know what's what's happening around oh, you. Yes, I think yes. I think a lot of there's a lot of guys that were around when you were around that aren't any longer in touch with what's going on around yes. them. How do you think that you've been able to stay in touch with what has gone on around you and what kids are listening to specifically? It's because I'm I'm very involved in I'm always around clubs. I'm always talking to people. I'm always like, even like when I had sugar, I'll constantly be talking to people like, what, what is cool? What did you like? What did you don't like? It's just keeping in touch with your people and moving with the times. Mm. Like all of a sudden, like 
one social network came about, it was like a whole nother ball game again. You mm. have to see now what you need to do. And what I used to do is, I would like, I would go and see how everyone else, the, the big guys are doing it, take a lot of influences from that. But you just have to move with the times to stay current. Yeah. You can't like say something like, oh, posting on Facebook is not for me. People want to know what you guys are doing. They want to know the personal side of you. They want to know like, like my wife always says, sometimes you post too much, but people want to know. And also for me, it's a record of my career. So for me, it's just main thing is keeping with the times, following, not only really following trends that don't suit you, but what works for you. Yeah. Like if you feel uh, the scene is going this way, but you still want to go, this doesn't work. Leave that, look for another idea. Yeah. Find out what works for you and stick to it, but also like what's current. Yeah. It's what what would you say? You, as you said, now you, you sort of think of what's happening next year and what you're going to do differently. How do you go about setting goals for yourself to achieve that next year? What sort of process do you have of thinking? This is what I want to do because I I would I would imagine that you've done a lot. You've done more than most people and, have. And do you know what the worst part is? Is staying original in a place like Johannesburg. Yeah. That's the, everything's been done here. Yeah. And for me, what, like next year I'm thinking now, like I've got my, my events brand is going well. So now what I want to do next year? So I think to myself something like next year, let's concentrate on the label. It's still part of me. Yeah. So next year I believe that I can, I want to concentrate on the label and do more sort of label parties than FEMO and his host parties. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the kind of the plan for next year is to concentrate more on the label itself and still maintaining my, my other stuff. But that's one of the ideas I have for next year. But I got a few else, which I don't really want to talk about right now. Yeah. But it's just a matter of sitting and thinking, what else can I do? Yeah. You know, like, but also I want to do something that's within my, 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 what do you have the word? Like something that's within my circle. Yeah. Within my path. I don't really want to go now and start signing dubstep music. Yeah, yeah, It's not what I do. Like, it's just like, for me, it's like concentrating on label, finding that next big, like a next team of ODV, yeah. which I have a few that I'm busy with, creating something if you mm -hmm. can't find it. Yeah. But like like I said, with the label, it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. It's something like, that's, it's like starting a new business. Something I've started from, like, I thought I, I could start a label as a DJ, but no, it's like I'm learning every day about how the music industry works. And there's so much things that I never thought about as a DJ. You know, so I think I think a lot of people might have the misconception that you started a label because you wanted fame or you wanted you wanted this label to become something that is other than just an opportunity to release great music. I think a lot of people look at people who, who, who start labels as a way for people to take advantage of younger people that or younger talent. And I think something that really has stuck out for me is just you've basically built a community around that label and that is what that is how a lot of house music started it started from independent labels it didn't really start from yeah, major labels yes, that are around now it was smaller labels that were going and pressing their own music it was smaller labels that were finding smaller artists and exposing them to that so it's not a case of you now trying to say oh i want to be a, i want to start a label because i want to do something cool it was it, it's that is nature that is how the house music came about but also like you know like you could start something out for me it's always for, always say it's all about the music yeah. always for me that's it the, the the like the fame and stuff doesn't matter because tomorrow fame will be gone mm. your good music will still last forever mm. and for me like the reason with well you you still have to have a good label with good music in order to get the fame if someone wants it. So you still have to do the same. I mean, you could have a label and have the shittiest music on it. Yeah. Or have the music that doesn't, the people don't like. So for me, you still have to work hard at owning a label to get the fame, I believe. Yeah. So, sure. so, so I don't think it would be, you can't really start a label out to have fame, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think you still got to put the work in to get your label to a point that gives you the fame. Yeah, but so. I think exactly as you said now, it's about growing that brand as well. Because I, th I for one, was somebody that when I got into listening to house music and wanted to become a DJ, I didn't really follow producers. I followed the labels. I followed the defectives, the soul, yes. soul candies. So, it's especially yeah. like that when you were buying records. Yeah. Because it was so expensive for a record, you had to know your labels too. Because there's so much shit out there, dude. Yeah. Like you, the labels are how, and that's what I'm trying and to do. And now it's 10 times worse. But now, uh, for me, all the new labels, they push out everything on the mm. label. All sorts of sounds. And... That's just something I didn't want to do. Like I'd get seeing so much good music that's like a tech, like a techno track that's really good, but it's just not. It's then not I, I was telling my wife we also what the plans was maybe to start a sub label, 
but we I first want to build one thing at a time. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's label's very cool. It's also opened up a lot of doors for me, where by now I can chat to my producer friends on a business level. Yeah. As opposed to just booking them for a gig. Yeah. It's again that exchange, yes. that exchange of value. It's all from, about relationships, yeah. dude. In, in anything, I believe. Yeah. I think the, I think with starting your own label and and as I, as I touched on earlier, sh- wanting to share knowledge with people and improve the industry is something that you, that you're really passionate about and why I wanted to speak to you about this topic about how you can grow your brand as a DJ. Um, but I think what what this what really motivated this video was a desire to share information on how people can grow their brand as a DJ. So if you ha- were in the position now where you hadn't been a DJ before and you wanted to get into DJing, you were 20 years younger, how would you go about it now? Do you have any advice for people that want to get into it? Do you know, uh, like I explained to you before, someone asked me this question the other day on another radio show and he asked me, like, what advice do you have for someone starting out now? And I told him, I'm like, you know what? I don't know. Yeah. Because when I came about and I made it and I made a name, things were so different back then. Obviously, the fundamentals stay the same, but the way you went about doing things was so different back then. And by the time this whole internet, so I was already in a place where I didn't have to do any of those things. But this, the simple fundamentals are the same. Like I was taught, like, and I believe a lot of youngsters are not taught this nowadays, is DJ ethics. Like a simple rule, like if I'm coming on after you, don't come on with my biggest track. Mm. You know, don't say, hi, everybody, I am. Da, 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 da. Mm. Come in slowly and build so people can, like, play the right time for the time slot. Don't be coming and playing a 10 to 12 set and playing your biggest bangers, yeah. you know. And and if you want to be, like, more of an underground DJ, stick to your sound. Like, don't anybody can go out there and play the biggest track sets on them. I mean, my NF crowd will rock. Like I said, rock the crowd tunes they don't know. Yeah. And for me, like, that's the advice I would give an uh, up-and-coming DJ is that stick to your lane. If you believe you like this sort of sound and it's kind of like... Because nowadays, it's very easy to be genre-specific. Yeah. Because the scene has grown so exponentially and it's, it's all there's the so many issues. different your techno clubs, and especially in Johannesburg. Mm. If you feel like you love techno, but you need to play hip-hop to, uh, like, you know and you want to be an underground DJ, I say stick to the, find a sound that works for you yeah. and stick to it so you don't be like everybody else. Yeah. Stick in your lane and just respect and what I hate about today's generation, it's the whole, um, what do you say, uh, quick gratification. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, like someone will start DJing today and after playing for like a year, which is not long, wants to say that truth. Yeah. And that's the one thing I admire about Guy. He's very finicky about and I've learned this from him, Manu, and that's what I incorporate in my, like, when you get booked for me, you, you want to post about it, you want to talk about it, because it's not easy, mm. you know? And I always try, same with Sugar, like you said, DJs got excited to play there, because I created that hype, mm. towards this club where it wasn't easy to get into, you know, you needed to have the tools, the experience, the yeah. And there were only four DJs at a time, playing exactly. every week. And like, so for me, like all advice I would give to kids today is just stick in your lane and just be humble about everything, you know, and don't, if you send someone like, don't pester people. Yeah. Like I get pestered a lot. Eh? Have you heard like, sometimes like, you know, I'm busy making a track. I don't have time to sit and listen to a mix. Yeah. Like I, especially sugar time. I don't get sent much now anymore. Sugar time. I got sent mix. Sorry, and I made it a point of going through most of the mixes that I get sent to see, cause I also want to give like, but I also believe that I've created a brand now where you need to be experienced to play for me because mm-hmm. I try and give the best of the best. Yeah. Like, even as an up-and-comer, you need to be an up-and-comer that's doing well and I, I see you out there. And also, one th- rule I have is I'll never book anyone I've never heard. Yeah. Unless you're an international or... Like, if you say, I want to book you, I need to hear you first. Yeah. Because that's just how I am about my brand and yeah, what I put sure. out, etc. So that's the advice I got to give. Just be humble, stay in your lane, and just work hard and network. Try and network a lot, but, but without being a pest. Yeah. You know, try and, like, if you go to a club, try having, a, like, a... Don't walk up to a club owner or club manager and say, hi, I'm this sort of guy. How's it going? I would rather go about, hi, I like this venue. I like what you're doing. Like, why don't you... Like, I do play. When you get a chance, if you can, please listen to my mix. I really believe I have the right sound. Whereas, yeah, here's my mix. Listen to it. I'll come and I'll rock. I always say, do first, then talk. Yeah. Don't tell me, I'll come rock the shit out of your club. Da, 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 da. Come rock it first. Then yeah. tell me, you see, I rock the shit out of your yeah. club. I always live by that. Do first, then talk. Yeah. You know? I think it, I'm, for me, it's one of the most frustrating things. Because, I mean, working for a label, you get your fair share of 
tracks and demos, but you also get guys that'll send you mixes. But they've sure. never they've never bothered connecting with you before. It's just what do you think of my mix? And now that I've started a blog, it's it's just as bad with guys wanting advice on it. And for me, I mean, yes, I'm putting myself out there, and I want to give people feedback, and I want to help you. But don't come off cold all of a sudden going, I will take a listen to this. There's a this way of the doing things, you know. Exactly. Like I'll never forget this one day. Um, it was so old school. Uh, this guy came to me and he's like. Um, but I really want to play at your events. Here's a CD. Pop it in your car. Take a listen to it. And I'll be honest. I put it in my bag. I was reading my set. And I put it in my bag. And I, forgot, and I always make it a point of, like, even with the label, I'll listen to every tune that comes in. Mm-hmm. I won't just say, I don't know this guy. I'm not going to listen to it. Mm-hmm. And I forgot about it. I was in my bag. I'm like, oh, okay. Here's the CD. And it was the most amazing. And I ended up booking the DJ. It's just timing. And, yeah. and also when you do it. Don't go up to a DJ while he's playing or when he's just finished his set. If when I finish my set, I just want to chill, have a drink, talk to my mates. I'm a bit tired. Like, you know, always get your timing right yeah. as well. If you see a guy is busy talking to all his friends and whatever, tell him like, you know, please, when you have a minute, I want to chat to you for one sec. Yeah. So let me know when you're done. Yeah. That sort of vibe. Like, yeah. I feel people are very, expect instant gratification yeah. nowadays. And a lot of the time, I'm, if you do that, they might actually be more willing to go, okay, well, just hold on. I'll speak to you now. Like, yeah. actually stop their conversation and come and chat to you rather than it be forcing yourself it's on that because then they'll approach. be already resilient to listening yeah. to what you approach have to say. This is what I believe in. And it's, 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 as you were saying, it, it's about, it's about reputation as well. It's about if, if you, if, if you're able to treat other people with respect, if you're able to go out and play, even if you, even if you're playing gigs that you would never go to, like if I was playing a gig and you'd never been, but I played that gig well, somebody might hear that and then book me somewhere else and then I might then from there, yeah. then you might, it's not a case of always, I want to play at Sugar, I'm only go- I'm going to go to Vimo and I want to play at Sugar, I'm going to ask him if I can play at Sugar or I want to play at one of Vimo and his O's events. You might have to first, for the first year, as you said, go and play a bunch of other gigs also, that have nothing to do with another that. Another good point is support the gigs you want to play at. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't come and tell me uh, I want to play at Sugar but I've never been there before. Mm. I want to play at one of your parties at Truth, and I've never been there before. Mm. Go and support the events. Go and like listen to the like. It's cool. Like it's cool to relate to someone that you've seen before. Like I've and also like I, you come to three of my parties, and by the fourth party you can't even say, you know what? I like what you're doing here. Here's my mixer. I'm like I recognize you. I see you. Yeah. It'll make me want to listen to you because you're supporting. Mm. You're supporting the event you want to play at. A lot of people don't do that. I believe mm. you need to go out and you need to go see okay this is the event on a play let me go see what's happening that's what I used to do mm. I used to go like if I had an off night I used to go to clubs that I'd want to play at and just go and see who's there see what's the vibe like you know Yeah. that's like in the beginning I did that a lot like I used to walk around with CDs in my bag like giving just giving people yeah so, but now it's different. Now you just get a link. That's why I said everything's so different now. Like, it's difficult for me to say because now it's, I would say, like, a lot of people don't even have CD players anymore. Like, yeah. I don't even have a CD ROM in my studio, you know? So, it's just different things, different times. You just got to move with the times. But main thing is just stay humble. And also don't, like, if, if you fail once, try again. Don't, like, leave that club, go to the next one. Yeah. Come back again. Maybe this one will give you a gig, and you can say, "Oh, I played here now. Maybe now I can try and go to mm. truth." It's all. It's all how you how you time things and how you you know. Yeah. It's attitude mainly is the main thing. I what do you look for in guys? Obviously, I, I feel that, as I said, you you have this passion for helping people and giving them an opportunity, and through your own events, you will give those guys a chance, and through the label, you're giving up and coming producers a chance. Yeah. What do you look for in up and coming DJs or producers? Uh, well, from a DJ point of view, for me, it's like, like I said, you know what the problem is nowadays? Is that nowadays, because of it's the producer's game, everybody nowadays is about coming and playing a set with, before was like, tunes that done, but now it's about coming and playing a set with unreleased music. That's the time we're living in now. All the top guys are playing stuff that's not released. Like for me, anybody can go and download the beat for Top 100. Or even if it's tunes, like for me, I always believe that if you play like within the style I'm looking for, Four tunes that I don't know or that I've never heard before and that I like and your mixing and stuff has to be tight, then I'd book you. It has to be the right sound. It has to be special. It has to be unique. Yeah. It mustn't be something that like anybody can do. That for me, you need to stand out. Like I brought Risha on recently. Because he's, 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 still, he's still not in the main yet, but he was also an up and coming and I heard two sets of his and I really enjoyed it. So mm. let me book this guy. 
But on the other hand now, I will go to Rockets and I will hear Sparrow play. And I'm like, damn, I forgot how Sparrow played. I haven't heard him in so long. Let me book him. You know, it just depends, like, timing, where you are, yeah. what I hear. Um, unless a really good source will tell me, like, like if Kassam would come to me and say, dude, you need to book this guy. He's really good. Mm. Like I think about it Because I'm always looking I always believe I, I, I believe I have my crew And I stick with my people Because my peeps are loyal to me But I always keep Two to three sets open To kind of like Because truth Luckily I have a lot of sets to yeah. fill And I always keep a few sets open And me and Guy Always fight about it Like he's not ready And also like he's ready And we always have this fight About who Because Guy is so strict About who plays at truth Because even if I do My own event there Everything goes through Yeah him. Everything has to be approved so yeah, just that's just how it is. Like that's how it goes, I guess. Well, I mean, I think that's that's really important advice for for guys that want to get into becoming a DJ. Because I think even if you you want to produce music as well, we were discussing it. It takes you a long time to become yes. efficient enough to make music that you want to release. The technical skills of learning how to work in in a DAW and producing music and compressing compression and EQing and all of that stuff that comes along with making music that is then ready to be played, that doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. A lot of people, I mean, there's a few people that will first learn how to produce music and then get into DJing. And I was somebody that went, first got into DJing and then production. So for the couple of years that it took me to learn how to produce, I mean, my focus was split between looking for new music and then making music. And I eventually made the conscious decision to go, I'd rather become a great producer yeah. than have to spend four or five hours every week. I mean, maybe two or three times a week looking for new music to play every week. I'd rather focus on production. Okay. And if you want to, if you, I mean, it, it depends on your situation. If you want to actually start making money off of DJing and that become your career and that put food on the table, you can't wait to become proficient enough in production. Yeah. You have to start out and become a DJ first. So I think, I think knowing how to get into that scene and knowing it's about networking and knowing it's about who you speak to and how you can build relationships. I think that's one way, even if you still want to produce music, of getting into DJing. Um, but I think that there's, there's, really, there's really not enough emphasis because we've discussed it on how important it is to produce music. I mean, now you've gotten into it recently as well, whether it's making tracks by yourself that you haven't but, released but like all the tracks that you cope with. Like you said, it's the, it's, the, it's the lengthy thing. So for me... I thought to myself, I could see this happening. Like I said, this time of year, I sit and I think. And I remember a couple of years ago sitting at the summer time of year and thinking to myself, this is the way things are going now. But for me to go and learn everything on my own, so that's when I thought, I know that I know music. That's when I thought, let me go sit with Tommy or Tommy D or go sit with Chanda. And I've learned so much from working with all these guys that are, I can start doing stuff on my own now. Mm. But I had to go through, and for me, that's how I learned. Like, I just watched these guys, like, everybody works so differently, and I just started working with some guys because I know what I want in my head. I just need someone to put it down yeah. exactly that way. Yeah. And I mean, that takes a long time to get and, good and enough yeah, you know, to be you able can to think do of that. a sound, but to make that sound on, on the programs, it's, it's not an easy task, you know? So for me, like, that's, but now I believe that I can, I can finally start doing things on my own, and that's one of the major. Our plans for next year is the production. Yeah, I, I'm set the goal for myself that by end of next year I want to be playing at least eighty percent of my own music. Yeah, so that's the goal. It was the goal for this year, but then I broke my arm and everything got delayed yeah. and life got in the just, way. Yeah, life got in the way this year. So yeah, next year that's the main goal for next year. If there was any advice that you could give your your twenty year old self, what do what do you think that would be? Because there's actually two things. The first thing would be is to, I would have gotten into production sooner. That's the one of my biggest regrets of my career is not getting into production like 10 years ago yeah. or 15 years ago or something. That's the one thing. And the second thing would be to not get stuck in your comfort zone. Like always try and be like, you know, like all of a sudden you're busy DJing and like, okay, cool, everything's going cool. Don't stop there. Think about shit. How can I get busier? How can I do more? What more can I do to like, you know, kind of complement one to the other yeah. you know that's only the because I also believe that I also got stuck in a comfort zone for many years whereby I just didn't have the same mentality that I and also moving to Joburg is what changed that mentality in me is you can't just you need to hustle here you mm. need to you know I mean you went from being a big fish in a little pond in PE to being having to compete because I mean I'm sure the competition here was a lot crazy, more yeah. 
and to adjust to that you have to yes. you have to always have one up. so that's basically the two things otherwise I'm very happy with the way things have went and the way I did everything mm. so yeah that was, that'll be the two main things I would tell myself so you you believe that it's not possible to grow your brand as DJ well maybe not possible not not possible but it, it it's more difficult to grow your brand as a DJ without producing yes if you if you're not established yet before the producing wave came I think you have to get today, you have to do it. I don't think there's any other way. And if you do, you, you, you then definitely want really special DJ that will stand out from whereby where maybe your trickery and stuff would wow crowds or yeah. like, you know, the way you do things or your music selection. But today, in today's times, that you have to be into mm. production, I would say. What do you think is more important, technical ability or song selection or music selection? Um, I would say they both go hand in hand because song selection, obviously, where you need to know, interpret how to read a crowd. Like, okay, this sort of vibe is not working. Let me try something else, you know? Like, for me, I always believe, like, I was taught even in the beginning, textbook style DJing is this bold and bold and bold and bold. But I figured out that with my music, this sort of vibe works. Yeah. Like, build them up, bring them down, build them up, bring them down. Yeah. Like, that sort of works with the style of music that I play. But then again, like if I'm playing a closing set at Truth and I'm playing in the morning, I know that like from four, from up past four, five in the morning, I would like to get a bit more. People are tired of the banging, going to like sort of a deeper journey, you know. Mm. So all, and I always say that all comes from teaching experience. You can't really, you need to experience that. No one can really teach you something like that. Mm. That comes from playing for years and years and, and yeah, that's just basically it, I think. Yeah. How do you structure your sets though? Do you start sort of slower yes I always believe like if I'll come on say after Carl Watson the truth um, he's already got the crowd right here mm. I always believe in going to the bottom again so coming in with something that's not as banging as him unless it's like really a big event and like you know it's like the club's packed and it's like cooking I would rather come down first and then work my way up again mm. That's generally, but like I said, also depends on, on the vibe and the, sometimes then I'll just have to keep it, if I feel the energy is cool where he was, I'll keep it there, yeah. you know? So it just depends on reading the crowd and how you're feeling, I guess. Do you ever prepare what you play beforehand? Uh, what I'd normally do is like, say if it's a big event, like if it's like an H2O, and I'm on main stage, I'll obviously have, I have my folders with the tunes that I want to play. I just put them in a folder, but I'll plan my first two tracks. Because obviously, if I'm going to start with an intro and if I can go anywhere I want, I'll plan my first two tracks and maybe think the last track I'm going to play and that'll be it. Mm. The rest is all by feel. And obviously, you just recently did your, your 20 years of Vimo six-hour set. Yeah. How did you go about preparing for that? Man, that took me, it took me honestly like five, six months. <laughs> I literally had to go through all, luckily for me, our music's very organized. Yeah. So to find everything wasn't, but to start, it was actually the best time ever because I got to go through all my music again. Yeah. And cons I took each year and I just took out all the tunes that I think I would want to play and that would be would go down today. Yeah. And that's how I started with each year. What from I know from digitally it started from two thousand and five. That's was when the digital every year uh, just going and listening through all my tunes. I had the best time, but it took long. And then I worked out that I'll probably need about 250 tracks if I mix my tunes out quickly. And after doing this whole story, I ended up with 700 tracks. <laughs> then I had to go through everything again and bring it. And eventually I got down to about 450 tracks and I said, I'm just going to leave it and I'll just play whatever yeah. I'm feeling. Was there any song that you didn't play that you wish you had played? <sighs> about 100. <laughs> <laughs> so many. I won't lie to you, that set went so quickly. Yeah. And it's, it's just like... Uh, how did you structure a six hour set? I'm very curious. Basically what I did was I had my music in all the different vibes and genres and yeah. I decided, okay, also because I started with an intro and I don't want to, and the worst thing is holding back. Yeah. It's like building and, and structuring everything. Yeah. But the thing with this is I didn't have to hold back because it was all my favorite tunes yeah. just from different times, you know? So I structured in a way where I'd started off like really, because Pump Squad was, uh, I was going to start off like deep and, and, Guy told me he's like from Pump Squad, he's like they were before me, he's like, We're gonna be banging by the time you come on at twelve. So I decided to start off housey and just build and build and then get into like sort of the electro stage and I didn't play any tunes from this year. I think I played one track from this year. It was all from last year going back because mm. I had so much to go through. 
and just going into the tech house and I just built it and I knew in the morning I was going to come down back to my lovely deep house in the morning music and I just structured that way started off here went up and came down again mm. that was the whole plan okay but it's so cool to just like not worrying about cramming your music like you could play and you just know you still have time like you know just to go through everything but as I said I still didn't play all the music I, want. I, I needed about another three four hours <laughs> and then you, you played off a of vinyl as well right? yes I played everything I played five I had two turntables and three CDJs hooked up so okay. it's quite cool when did you make that transition from vinyl to to from, from vinyl to CDJ basically I was always against it because I was a purist like yeah. you know and I realized at a stage where like once again all my friends were making music at the time and they were giving it to me on CD so I actually bought the CDJ 100 that I would take with me to my gigs and plug it in mm. and I'll play on vinyl and one or two CDs in between and like you know and and after that it's just like eventually you realize like you're playing more on CD than vinyl and it just eventually just switched over but mm. for long I carried records and CDs together for long but then music started becoming you need to be more current yeah. and and then eventually just started leaving the records at home. It's just, that's what happened. Okay. Is there any advice that you want, like that you you really want to to impart on, on up and coming DJs besides what we've said in terms of it's about building relationships and knowing your lane? Is there one thing that you wish you'd known 20 years ago other than getting into production, but one thing you'd really taken into your DJ career 20 years ago? Just be humble, eh? Mm. That's the main thing. Be humble and be a nice person. Like, you know, treat people with the respect they deserve. And everything will come to you. Like, I honestly believe, like, what you give is what you get. What you put in is what you're going to get. So, and a lot of people, like a lot of the guys now, you can't just go and become a DJ. You need to have another job. Because the, everybody thinks, like, you know, we spoke about earlier, like, everybody thinks DJs make all these great money. When you're starting, you don't make good money, you mm. know what I mean? So, it's just like, just be passionate about what you're doing. Be humble. Just like, you know, stay in your lane and just be a nice guy. That's all. Be someone that people will want to work with. Yeah, for sure. That's the main thing. Try and think about the kind of person that you would want to work with and try and be that person. Simple. Where do you see yourself going in the next few years? Obviously, we've spoken about growing the label and getting yeah. into better production, but what do you, do you believe that there's any specific goal that you'd like to achieve in the next few years? Um... To be honest, I, I'm living the dream right now and I have I feel like my goals are what I'm living. But for the next few years, I don't see myself stopping DJing anytime soon because I love it so much. Yeah. Uh, probably, maybe, I would like to open up a little place, like a, like a restaurant bar kind of effort one day. Mm. Something small where, because I honestly believe I'll always play. Mm. Even if it always said I'll play in my own place one day when I feel like, you know. Um, that would probably be the goal for the next few years. But right now, I'm happy with where everything's going and that's just the one goal though i want to own like a little sort of place like aruba lounge was you know mm. that sort of size mm. i always wanted a place like that yeah. for me and if i had the money i'd buy truth tomorrow to be honest <laughs> <laughs> so uh like you know for me I, I would like to own my own little place like i have mm. that's one thing i do miss with not having sugar anymore is having somewhere to call my having an event a couple of times a year it's different to having something you got to nurture every week yeah so that's my I want to have and that's one of my goals for next year is to get another night not really a Sunday because you know Sundays are just a bit of a mission mm. but um, I'm going to start a, a, a week night next year I found a venue already I'm busy working on all of that so that's the goals like I'll probably but I'll say for the, at least for the next five years for me it's just bringing the people the best music DJing to the best that I can and growing the label and growing my events and stuff like that you know just growing everything because sometimes you can't you have so much, it's enough. You've got to grow that now. Yeah. You know, you don't want to bring something else on board that takes your attention away from yeah. what's working. Yeah, especially, I think I think you really have to do what, if, if you put your mind to doing something, you have to do it the best you possibly can. Yeah. Give it enough love and enough attention yes. and you will see some sort of result with it. Yes. If you only do something half-assed and you're trying to do a bit of everything, I think... Uh, it's difficult in this day and age because you, as a DJ, you have to be so diverse. You can't just be the oak that comes and plays music. You, you touched on it. You have to promote on social media. Yes. You have to know a little bit about uh, marketing because you're going to now try and bring people to your own events sometimes. Yes. You have to know a little bit about design. You have to know a little bit about everything. So you have to really, you have to really 
dip your toe in a bit of everything, but at the same time, really make sure that what you're doing is 100% the best that it possibly can be. And I think with, with, with Chutney, you've been doing that where you don't release a thousand releases in a year. You don't put out a hundred tracks. It has to be specific sound and it has to be a specific quality. And I think that is why you've then been able to see the, the growth that you have. And I think you just really need to keep that up. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's been going well. It's also been a lot of trial and error, but mm. we're getting there. Cool. So I really think that people uh, who are watching this will get a lot of value out of hearing firsthand from you how you were able to build your career and what you've learned and how you've been able to overcome obstacles and the way that you think about your career and how you you still at 20 years later or 20 years down the line are still trying to think how can I grow how can I still go forward instead of just sitting back and being complacent and I think with like I said with wanting to share the stuff that I put out on my blog or giving young guys an opportunity to to, to grow themselves and, and play at your events, you are in some form enriching the, the scene. And a lot of guys that are from the generation that you came from in terms of DJing have, from my perspective anyway, sort of looked down on the, the kids coming into into the scene now because it's just suddenly become this flood of, of, of everybody wanting to be a DJ. And I think by embracing that change and wanting to start a label that grows that scene and wanting to throw events and giving kids an opportunity to play on those lineups it, it it's your part in growing the scene forward and i think that's the only way that it, it benefits you as well yes, i exactly, mean yeah. uh, if, if you're not willing to to put the effort into growing your scene and and uh, just putting in the hours to to help others then there is no scene for any of us whether it's working with promoters and uh, building good relationships with them or other djs or producers i think that you really have to give back in some way, and as you said, that's that's part of part and parcel of uh, of networking and building those relationships is offering people some value as well. Yes. Um, and I think that's something that that you've really done well in the last twenty years. So I think I think whether it's somebody that's we watching this video who wants to be a DJ or who wants to be a producer or wants to sign to Chutney Records or who's just somebody that's interested in it and is a fan of yours, I think there's a lot that they can take away from this and, and just hopefully they, they really enjoyed hearing from you because I did. I like Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I hope I was able to help and my story kind of helps you. But yeah, thank you. That was cool. awesome.